biological information purifying selection. We've been discussing the book, Biological Information, New Perspectives, uh, edited by uh, Robert Marks, Michael Behe, William Dembski, Bruce Gordon, and John Sanford. Four of those may be familiar to those of you who are familiar with uh, intelligent design advocates. Uh, Bruce Gordon is, uh, is probably better known in uh, uh, circles of self-organization. The book itself is published by World Scientific Publishing Company. I ran into the fact that it apparently is from Singapore. I guess far enough away from the reach of the Darwin bots that uh, it, the book didn't get canned there. It was published in 2013. It's actually the uh, subject of a 2011 uh, symposium at Cornell University. Uh, originally, it was supposed to be published by Singer, uh, Springer, pardon me, in Germany, and uh, the Darwin bots got to them, and they declined to publish it. It is available on the internet uh, for free, although given that World Scientific Publishing Company stuck its neck out, I went and bought a copy of my own. I know they're expensive. It's a donation. You can figure that. But I think it's a worthwhile one. There's the book itself. The um, book has a general introduction, which we uh, went through, information theory and biology, which we've been through most of the chapters, the important ones, at least in my estimation. And right, uh, we're biological information and genetic theory, theoretical molecular biology, Biological Information and Self-Organizational Complexity Theory. So this is not an intelligent design book strictly, but um, uh, it is uh, questioning whether standard uh, Darwinian theory can, uh, or neo-Darwinian theory can account for uh, what we see in nature. And the, the section we're on right now is Biological Information and Genetic Theory. The chapter we're looking at is Can Purifying Natural Selection Preserve Biological Information? Written by Paul Gibson, John Baumgartner, whom some of you remember from here, uh, Wesley Brewer, and John Sanford, whom some of you also remember from here. Um, uh, interestingly enough, John Baumgartner appears to be uh, at the Department of Earth Environmental Sciences at Ludwig Maximilians University in Germany, in Munich. Uh, at least uh, in 2011, that was the case. Uh, but he was still around Southern California not that long ago, so I don't know what's happening there. Um, the abstract starts out, most deleterious mutations have very slight effects on total fitness. And it has become clear that below a certain fitness effect threshold, such low impact mutations fail to respond to natural selection. The existence of such a selection threshold suggests that many low-impact deleterious mutations should accumulate continuously, resulting in relentless erosion of genetic information. In this paper, we use numerical simulation to examine this problem of selection threshold. <coughs> the objectives of this research was to investigate the effect of various biological factors individually and jointly on mutation accumulation in the model human population. For this purpose, we used a recently developed biologically realistic numerical simulation program, Mendel's Accountant. Um, this program introduces new mutations into the population every generation, uh, apparently using a random number generator kind of thing, and uh, tracks each mutation through the process of recombination, gamete formation, mating, and transmission to the new offspring. This method tracks which individuals survive to reproduce after selection and records the transmission of each surviving mutation every generation. This allows a detailed mechanistic accounting of each mutation that enters and leaves the population over the course of many generations. We term this, kind, this type of analysis genetic accounting. Across all reasonable parameter settings, we observed that high impact mutations were selected away with very high efficiency, while very low impact mutations accumulated just as if there was no selection operating. There was always a large transitional zone where mutations with intermediate fitness effects 
accumulated continuously. You're going to see some graphs on that. But at a lower rate than would occur in the absence of selection. To characterize the accumulation of mutations of different fitness effect, we developed a new statistic, selection threshold. Uh, as ST stands for selection threshold. D stands for deleterious mutations. We're going to see probably STB in the next chapter um, for beneficial mutations, which is an empirically determined value for a given population. A population selection threshold is defined as that fitness effect wherein deleterious mutations are accumulating at exactly half of the rate expected in the absence of selection. This threshold is midway between entirely selectable and entirely unselectable mutation effects. Our, investigator, our investigations reveal that under a very wide range of parameter values, selection thresholds for deleterious mutations are surprisingly high. Our analysis of the selection threshold problem indicate that given even modest levels of noise affecting either the genotype-phenotype relationship or the genotype fitness survival reproduction relationship. Accumulation of low impact mutations continually degrades fitness, and this degradation is far more serious than has been previously acknowledged. Introduction. More than 40 years ago, Mueller concluded that there exists a class of low impact mutations that are beyond the reach of natural selection. Um, Miller, Kimura, uh, various people uh, are very well-known population geneticists, so this is not something that's hiding in a corner. Uh, Kimura greatly expanded upon this theme using mathematical modeling to study the problem. Although Kimura initially described such mutations as neutral, Ota argued that such mutations should be more accurately treated uh, termed nearly neutral, and Kimura later agreed. Kondrashov realized that very low impact mutations are not only inherently unselectable, but they also pro create a profound evolutionary paradox. Later, Lynch et al. and Higgins and Lynch provided evidence that accumulation of low impact mutations plays an important role in the extinction process. Recently, low showed that accumulation of nearly neutral mutations is a theoretical problem even for haploid genomes as small as that of human mitochondria. His analysis suggests that accumulation of nearly neutral mutations within the mitochondria alone could potentially lead to human extinction. Given that nearly neutral mutations have such profound biological implications, it would seem important to understand better the primary factors that control the accumulation of low impact deleterious mutation. A useful way to conceptualize selection's ability to influence the mutation, accumulation of low impact mutations is in terms of signal versus noise. Those of you who have listened to radios will be familiar with that concept, I think. Signal is what you're trying to listen to. The noise is that hiss in the background that you can't uh, that makes it very difficult to hear the signal. Signal corresponds to the level of influence a mutation has on its own transmission. Noise, by contrast, corresponds to various types of interference that reduce the correlation between a mutation's effect on functional fitness and its probability of transmission. When the signal is weak and the noise is, insuffic is sufficiently strong, the signal is obscured and selection breaks down. At that point, the correlation between the mutation's effect on functional fitness and the likelihood of that mutation's transmission becomes too small for selection to affect the frequency of that mutation in the population in any significant way. Kimura was the first to attempt to quantify the threshold for selection breakdown. His calculations focused only on the influence of one source of noise on the rate of mutation fixation, that is, that of gametic sampling. 
Kimura found that the strength of this confounding effect on selection varies inversely with the effective population size. N stands for number, of course, and E stands for effective. Um, that is, if you have mutations in uh, organisms that are not reproducing, it doesn't count. In small populations, a relatively small number of gametes are extracted to produce the next generation. I'm um, not reading this straight through. If you want to read it straight through, um, you can go to the website. Uh, sampling error, a type of noise that interferes with selection, which is strong in small populations and can override all but the strongest selection pressures. However, in larger populations, the gametic sampling error is smaller because random chance can't overwhelm uh, when there are lots of chances that are being taken. Uh, it tends to smooth it out. Therefore, selection for low-impact mutations can be more effective in larger populations. Restricting his analysis to this single source of noise, Kimura developed his now well-known approximation of the magnitude of the selection coefficients needed to overcome the drift, which is S, a selection is 1 over 2 times the effective population. Most subsequent studies have utilized this estimate for the point at which purifying selection breaks, breaks down. I added the word purifying in that case. I think it's fair in context, but you can look it up if you don't like it. It is obvious, however, that there are other sources of biological noise besides gametic sampling. All of these other sources of noise should reduce the correlation between the magnitude of the effect of a specific mutation on the functional fitness of an individual and the influence of that mutation on the individual's reproductive success. That is what it should do versus what it does do. Lynch, for example, notes that small population size, which Kimura said, but also large nucleotide distances between crossovers, that is there aren't that many crossovers, and high mutational rates. So high mutational rates can make it worse, and we'll look at that. All synergistically reduce the efficiency of natural selection. To study some of these biological factors and to quantify how they affect the selection threshold beyond their predicted direct effect on the selection coefficient, we adopt a numerical simulation strategy using the program Mendel's Accountant. And uh, there's a, a website that you can actually play with this program yourself. This numerical approach affords us much flexibility to explore the biological complexity of the mutation selection process as it actually occurs in nature. Numerous other studies have been done on this subject we explore those, uh, we include, we extend those explorations by including environmental variants, a range of different mutation rates, and various forms of selection. That is going from truncation, which is to say, if you've got the mutation, they take you out and shoot you. Or alternatively, they take you out and sterilize you so you can't have kids. Partial truncation, which is a mixture of truncation and standard probability selection, which is the, uh, uh, if you have the mutation, you just won't have quite as many kids. The earliest reference, Mueller stated, there comes a level of advantage, however, that is too small to be effectively seized upon by selection, its voice being lost in the noise, so to speak. This level would necessarily differ greatly under different circumstances, genetic, ecological, etc. But this is a subject that has yet been subject to little analysis, although deserving of it. So Mueller knew about it way back when. Mueller's recognition that there are deleterious mutations that are practically invisible to the selection process contributed to his overall concern about ge genetic deterioration. It also contributed to his concern about the problem of linkage-mediated deterioration in fitness, Mueller's ratchet. 
The goal of this paper is to explore the biological circumstances to which Miller, uh, Miller alluded that can make a large fraction of deleterious Im mutations immune to selection. And I'm not going to go through their results, but, uh, well, we will, but uh, just at one point. Results, conditions allowing perfect purifying selection. So how can you get pur perfect purifying selection? Several uh, experiments were first conducted to discover the region of parameter space in which there is zero near-neutral mutation accumulation. We found that complete elimination of near-neutrals requires that all sources of noise be reduced to extre either extremely low levels or zero. As a general rule, that requires zero environmental variation. Heritability equals one. Perfect truncation selection. You have the mutation, they take you out and shoot you. Sufficiently high selection intensity and sufficiently low mutation rates to maintain near zero genetic variance. And we obtained this result, for example, for the case of zero environmental variance, perfect truncation selection, a mutation rate of one mutation per individual per generation, and the default reproduction rate of six offspring per female, allowing for selection to eliminate two-thirds of all ops offspring, maintaining a constant population size. In this case, the Poisson distribution, defining the number of new mutations assigned to each offspring, yielded enough individuals with no mutations, 37% on average, and wonder where they got that number, we'll show you in a minute, so that truncation selection against all mutations still allowed maintenance of the designated population size. Now let me say a little bit more about that Poisson distribution. As a formula, probability of getting k mutations, where k is a number from zero to infinity, is e to the minus lambda, where lambda is the average number of mutations, lambda to the k power, t uh, divided by uh, k factorial, which is 1 times 2 times 3 times 4 times 5 times whatever, times k minus 1 times k. 2 factorial would be 1 times 2, or 2. 3 factorial would be 1 times 2 times 3, or 2 times 3, or 6. For lambda equals 1, which is what they're proposing, um, lambda to the k is equal to 1 also, so it drops out. And k factorial is, uh, uh, so you, the formula becomes e to the minus 1, or 1 over e. Um, times k factorial, or 1 over e times k factorial. Uh, for k equals 0 and k equals 1, k factorial equals 1, and pro the probability equals 1 over e, which equals 0.368, more or less, and that's where they got their 37%. For 6 offspring, and lambda equals 1, we expect 2.2 children to have no genetic defects. So that gives us a little margin of safety, allowing, uh, allowing us to keep enough children without de genetic defects. Now, of course, in some families it will be 0, in some families it will be 4, and some families it will be 5, but the average is going to be about 2 little over. Now, P sub-zero, uh, sub probability of getting zero defects in any, uh, turns out to be e to the minus lambda. And if when lambda equals 3, e to the minus lambda equals 20 percent. When lambda equals 5, e to the minus lambda is less than 1 percent. So as lambda gets larger, uh, those numbers rapidly uh, go down. The probability of having a kid without any genetic defects becomes, and if lambda is 150 uh, e to the minus lambda becomes 
an infinitesimal number. Basically, none of us are going to have perfect kids. None of us are even going to have kids as good as we are, which is you always hope your kids are better than you. Uh, as in all other experiments reported here, replicate experiments with different random number seeds produce no meaningful differences in outcome. Therefore, for this and all following analysis, we will only report results from single representative runs. So you'll see some graphs that are not quite perfectly even. That's because those are real numbers that they ran those uh, with, not just, uh, uh, not just formulaic uh, projections. Effects of high mutation rate and mutation, in mutation interference. So first we're going to talk about the mutation rate, what difference it makes. We next conducted a series of similar experiments, but with mutations rates of 5, 10, 20, and 40 per diploid genome per generation. By the way, humans, it's probably about 100. 60 to 120, depending on which numbers you believe. Uh, for the mutation rates greater than one mu new mutation rate per individual, a type of biological noise arises associated with selection interference among mutations. Results are summarized in figure one. Now before I go there, I want to point out that these mutations are distributed as to being lethal, near lethal, mm, strongly deleterious, weakly deleterious and almost neutral. And so this is the kind of graphing that you get with their, their standard uh, mutation distribution. And you can see that when u equals 5, we get to the halfway point. That's that uh, STD uh, way down at uh, 10 to the Eight. And if we're looking at 10, it's up at around 10 to the seventh, a little less. And if we're going to 20, we're looking at that point at 10 to the uh, 10 to the six, more or less. And here we're looking at a little less than 10 to the five. And you can see that. They, they haven't gra graphed them all the way out, but you can see that you started out with a curve and then it gradually tapers off at the other end. That's that sigmoid shaped curve that we were talking about. While high, uh, high impact mutations had zero accumulation, extremely low impact mutations displayed accumulation fractions approaching 1.0. The transition zone between these two extremes is characterized by an S shaped curve. We defined the selection threshold for all deleterious mutations as the midpoint of this transition zone. More specifically, ST sub D is the value of mutation fitness effect for which the accumulation fraction is 0 0.5, indicating that half as many mutations have accumulated as would be expected under complete neutrality, that is, no selection. Uh, to go back here, what they're saying is this is no selection, and this is fierce 100% selection. And so when it reaches this point, it's halfway between no selection and absolute selection. Figure 1 illustrates that an increased mutation rate and consequent selection interference among alleles led to STD values uh, sub D in a increasing from 6.8 times 10 to the minus 9 for mutation rate of 5 to 7.4 times 10 to the minus 8 for a mutation rate of 10 to 5.2 times 10 to the minus 7th for a mutation rate of 20 and 3.2 times 10 to the minus 6 for a mutation rate of 40 with the standard mutation d distribution. At the highest mutation rate, 75% of the mutations were below the select selection threshold and hence were effectively unselectable. So most of the mutations stuck. Effects of environmental variants. We conducted a series of similar experiments, but instead of increasing mutation rate, we kept the rate at one per offspring and introduced environmental variants quantified in terms of fitness heritability, uh, genotypic variance versus, uh, divided by phenotypic variance ratio. 
To illustrate our findings, we present three cases with fitness heritabilities of 0 0.4, 0 0.04, and 0 0.004. And let me explain that one to you a little bit. This is like supposing you were selecting for tallness or strength. And you had children who, whose genes would naturally make them stronger or taller or would make them weaker or, or, or uh, shorter. But they didn't get the proper feeding when they were kids. Well, they're going to be shorter or smaller or weaker through no fault of their genes. So if you're selecting for tallness, you're not just selecting for the genetics, you're also selecting for environmental influences. And in some cases, the environmental influences will actually swamp the genetic ones. And that's when that happens and you try to select, you'll wind up not selecting the genes at all. You wind up selecting the environment instead. And as expected, the heredity of 0.4 will give you a um, ST sub D that is considerably lower than the ST sub D for 0.04 or 0.004. Heritability of fitness in nature has often been found to be very low. That is, you can't really tell which ones have the bad genes in them. And such a fitness heritability value yielded a high ST sub D, 2.6 times 10 to the minus fifth after 10,000 generations. Given this level of environmental variance, the average mutation count per individual increased at a nearly constant rate of 0 0.86 mutations per individual per generation. This is with one mutation per generation. But now things are a little confused, and so you can't select as well. This means that 86% of all the newly arising mutations were below the selection threshold and were essentially unselectable in spite of very intense selective pressure. Effects of varying degrees of randomness within the selection process itself. In another series of experiments, we examined the manner in which some randomness in the selection process itself that, uh, that is, uh, or for example, partial or complete probability selection influences ST sub D. And again, if you have absolute selection and one mutation on average per generation, you can get everything to sit on this bottom line. If you have only probability selection, that is to say, the probability goes down that you'll have kids if you have the mutation. You're not taken out and shot, you just simply don't have quite as many kids that survive. Um, then you get a curve that uh, looks something like this, and you'll notice there's some variation because these are actual real numbers rather than computer-generated ideal numbers. And um, if you have partial trunc truncation, somewhere between the probability and the um, uh, and, and the uh, absolute truncation. Then, of course, you get a, an intermediate amount of mutation surviving. And again, this is with six offspring per female, mutation rate 1.0, heritability, that is, we're saying that Nothing except the heredity influences what's going on. And those are the numbers you get. Effects of uh, minimal levels of noise from multiple sources. What have, happens if you combine all of these things together? Here we present an experiment that combines minimal levels of noise from multiple sources. The purpose of this experiment was to estimate the lower limit for STD values in typical mammalian populations. We chose what we felt were best case parameter settings, but it should be clear that settings used are biologically unrealistic in that there should be more noise, much more noise in most natural circumstances. Their parameter choices were partial truncation, 
mutation rate of 5.0, and a fitness heritability of 0 0.4. Results from this experiment are shown in figures 4 through 7, and here's what you get. And notice that things that will decrease your probabilities by 1 in 10,000 stick around half the time. But you see, each mutation decreases by 1 in 10,000. Well, as you keep adding those up, eventually uh, that comes back to haunt you. Um, figure 4 shows that multiple sources of noise, even at minimal levels, result in a very appreciable STD. That is 7.6 times 10 to the minus 5. In this instance, 90% of all mutations were below the selection threshold of their standard distribution, and were hence effectively unselectable. Some mutations accumulated in which had fitness level effects as large as 0 0.001. Selection breakdown was essentially complete below 0 0.00001. And figure 5 shows the distribution of mutant alleles accumulation in greater detail using a linear scale for the x-axis focusing on just low-impact alleles. Moving from left to right, a smooth transition is evident from fully selectable alleles to partially selectable alleles, and finally to alleles that are entirely unselectable. Now, one thing to pay attention to is the scales are slightly different on this one. Uh, instead of, uh, uh, this is a linear scale instead of a log scale that you've been seeing. And the other thing is that uh, the frequency goes up to 0 0.01, and actually there's a, uh, this um, goes up past 100 at this point. Uh, I mean, there's 100 times as much space above the graph as there is in the graph itself before you get to 1. So they're just showing you that there's very, very low accumulation until you get quite low, about 0.0. .0 Zero, zero, 005, and then all of a sudden it shoots up. Figure 6 shows that the rate of mutation accumulation was remarkably constant at 4.5 mutations per individual per generation over 10,000 generations, even with intense selective pressure. Given the mutation rate of 5.0, only 10% of the deleterious mutations were successfully eliminated by selection. That's 90% kept. We consistently observed a very constant rate of mutation accumulation, even when experiments were extended to the point of extinction or to the point of computer memory overflow, due to large numbers of accumulated mutations being tracked for every individual. And you can see it's a nearly a linear progression as time goes on. It doesn't stop. Figure 7 shows that under biologically relevant conditions, the population's mean fitness declined continuously as mutation count per individual increased. In this particular case, fitness declined by 16% during the first 10,000 generations. When this experiment was extended to the limits of computer memory, fitness declined to near extinction in 4,831 generations with an average accumulation of 174,890 mutations per individual. The rate of fitness decline was essentially linear after generation 10,000. And you can see how at first it goes down pretty rapidly and then it kind of levels out. But it doesn't really level out. It just keeps going down and down and down. Um, ignore this. This is the standard deviation and th that tells you how accurate uh, these numbers are. They're pretty accurate. Effects of larger population size, more time, and more recombination. Figure 8 shows the effect of population size on ST sub D over time using partial truncation selection within the same setting as for the case displayed in Figure 4 to 7. Here is in all our other simulations when starting with zero genetic variance, as might occur after a severe bottleneck, ST sub D values initially start very high but decline rapidly. And you can see how they decline very rapidly, and then they and then they kind of uh, smooth out. They the rate keeps going. Now the rate here keeps dropping, but in the meantime you're still adding more and more mutations. 
And when this experiment was extended, we saw that for the population size of 10,000, there was no significant decline in ST sub D after roughly 150,000 generations. Larger populations clearly took longer to reach selection equilibrium, but given enough time, reached markedly lower final ST sub D values, increasing the population size from 1,000 to 10,000, slowed fitness decline only modestly. Average fitness of 0 0.84 versus 0 0.79 in generation 10,000. This result may seem surprising in light of the conventional wisdom that selective selection effectiveness is directly proportional to population size. However, increasing population size from 1,000 uh, to 10,000 reduced the ST sub D at generation 10,000 by only a small amount on an absolute scale. Uh, went from 1.5 times 10 to the minus 4 or 15 times 10 to the minus 5, if you like, to 7 times 10 to the minus 5, and thus did not greatly slow the decline of fitness. It still keeps going down. Figure 9 shows the effective population sizes on percent retention after 10,000 generations. Within this limited amount of time, there was only a trivial advantage in having population sizes greater than 5,000. With a population size of 5,000, the rate of mutation accumulation was 89%. Doubling their population size to 10,000 resulted in 89%, um, 89.05, and doubling the population to 20,000 resulted in no further improvement, 89.05 still. Basically, it doesn't do you much good. And you can see as you have more populations, you go from 97% retention to 89%, and then it flattens out. Experiments using the latest estimate of human mutation rate and fitness di effect distribution. Now, this is an interesting thing. We report two Mendel experiments using the most recently published estimate of the human mutation fitness effect distribution, which requires shifting the fi fitness effect distribution towards higher impact mutations. Lynch estimated that there is an average of at least three distinctively deleterious mutations, new mutations, per newborn a very conservative estimate. Ouch. These are ones that we can actually detect. Lynch reported various other types of mutations whose effects are almost certainly deleterious, but possibly weak. So they w these were not considered in these experiments. So the number might actually be a little higher. And this is what happens to populations. This upper graph is with a uh, partial truncation. And this lower graph is done with only probability. And I want you to notice what happened after 8,000 generations. Population went extinct. How many generations was the upper graph to go extinct? Well, I, I don't know for sure. But if you were to extrapolate it, I suppose that it would probably be somewhere around 15 to 20,000. I'm sorry? It's 80,000, and then you have extinction on the red line. Yeah, 80,000. So we're talking 150,000, more or less. Discussion. General implications. This study shows that under conditions relevant to many mammalian populations, the large majority of deleterious mutations should escape purifying selection. Given a specific population and specific circumstances, there must be a certain point where selection against low-impact mutations breaks down. Numerical simulation allows us to empirically determine this selection threshold for any particular set of conditions. We expand on previous work by showing that the value of ST sub D is not a simple function of population size, but is affected by numerous variables. The theoretical and practical implications of these results should be of wide interest. It is important to estimate accurately the lower limits of effects that respond effectively to selection. Over the past several decades, it has been tacitly assumed that population size is the primary determinant of this lower limit. This important assumption, explicit in Kimura's fa famous formula, S equals 1 over 2N sub B, has been used by most investigators for defining the threshold for selection breakdown. However, our extensive investigations have in indicated that mutation rate 
environmental variance, selection mode, and time are all important variables that affect ST sub D in addition to population size. Unless some entirely unknown mechanism is operating, it appears that net genetic deterioration is an inevitable aspect of the mutation selection process given known mutation rates and fitness effects. It is widely supposed that within any viable population, natural selection must be able to act effectively on deleterious mutations at millions of loci simultaneously, even though most such mutations have vanishingly small fitness effects and their selection is compromised by multiple levels of interfering biological noise. The result of the current study involving biologically re realistic numerical simulations clearly show that selection simply cannot do this. If natural selection cannot reasonably be expected to halt degeneration of genomic information, then there must be a profound problem with the present formulation of neo-Darwinian theory. We suggest that this is a matter of great significance and should interest all serious scholars. And then they have a section on robustness of findings, which I'll just quote part of. We found these results to be highly reproducible. Replicated runs employing alternate random number seeds produce essentially identical results, creating only trivial variations. Other researchers can replicate the experiments reported here by downloading the Mendel's Accountant program along with its user manual at uh, the website there, and by using the parameter settings listed in Appendix 1 for those parameters not presented in the specific experiments above. Conclusion, in conclusion, numerical simulation shows that realistic levels of biological noise result in a high selection threshold. This results in the ongoing accumulation of low impact deleterious mutations with deleterious mutation count per individual increasing linearly over time. Materials and methods, and I'm going to skip over that and go to the addendum, which is even more fascinating. These numerical simulation studies have been theoretical in nature based on biologically realistic numerical simulations. A new study of actual mutation accumulation with the H1N1 influenza virus for what it's worth, that's what created the uh, flu pandemic in 1918. Now provides strong empirical validation of our findings. C. Carter, R.C., and Sanford, J.C. And you look at an old virus patterns of mutation accumulation in the human H1N1 influenza virus since 1918. Theoretical biology and medical modeling. Some of you who may, have, uh, may remember that Sanford was working on this paper when he came here last time. Apparently he got it published. That study analyzed actual mutation accumulation within the H1N1 influenza viral genome since 1918. During the entire history of human H1N1, mutations accumulated in a perfectly linear fashion, exactly, exactly as seen in all our theoretical studies. In the course of 90 years, almost 15% of the viral genome mutated, with mutation count increasing at a very constant rate. During this time, viral fitness, as reflected by associated human mortality rates, declined continuously and systematically from 1918 all the way to the apparent extinction of the human H1N1 strain in 2009. Wow. Anyway, my take. This paper... Uh, puts numbers to the assertion that genetic entropy cannot be controlled by natural selection. The qualitative and semi-quantitative arguments in genetic entropy are supplemented by quantitative arguments. I think Stanford has proved his point. The only answer to this argument I can see is that we have obviously been here for millions of years without the predicted catastrophe happening, so there must be something wrong with the calculations. This argument, of course, assumes that evolution happened as usually theorized. It is vulnerable if one does not assume the standard time scale. In other words, it's a circular argument. But that's my opinion. Now it's your turn. Go ahead. Uh, Paul, uh, I wish you could go back to the last slide 
that had this diagram where you have that drop off. Sure. Uh, and just tell us why does it drop off so suddenly? Okay. Way back there, the last. Let's see if I can do this correctly. This uh, one, right? Yeah. Okay. Um, what happens is that at first there's a lot of extra uh, there's a lot of extra capacity in the in the genome, but when you get down near the end, the fact that you can only reproduce at, at a limited rate because uh, the mortality goes up means that you no longer have six kids per generation effectively, um, you know, two of which survive. Now you're lucky to get two kids. And so the, the uh, accumulation of deleterious mutations drastically uh, increases and the kinds of mutations incre uh, that are deleterious increase mm -hmm. until uh, until you start having lethal mutations taking everything. Does that have anything to do with redundancy in the system that gets worn out? Yeah, basically. Reserve capacity shrinks to zero. So, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a spiraling in, and it's a real problem uh, with species that are on the verge of extinction because they're just not enough you know, if, if something random happens, you know, all of a sudden you're had. Because you don't have the room for lots and lots of extra um, creatures that could, could manage to counteract that. So th this is the basis of uh, Stanford's, Stanford's uh, statements that uh, human population is not going to last. That many That's right. More years. It gets it gets worse and worse, and then all of a sudden it nosedives. And then to get an influx, a new gene pool that might change the picture. Yeah, that's right. If you get a, if you get a new if you get uh, if you get some kind of, some kind of new genetic information that can correct all those errors. Yeah, let's uh, give it. Uh, Neanderthals mixing supposedly with the other um, groups, the human noise and all those others, so that it was an influx of new gene pools. And recently I read that domestication of horses within the last few 40,000 years, that's the window period has done them more harm than good. It's because of the limited gene pool that they were subjected to. Yeah. But I think the really important lesson is that even if you have, even if you expand the gene pool, even if you have, you know, 10,000 or 100,000 instead of, you know, 1,000 or 100, it still nosedives. It just takes longer. We're doomed without intervention. I don't, I don't know if you, I was a little late, so I might have missed something. But it doesn't make sense if it, if you're considering the uh, like the H1N1, the bacteria as they multiply, their generations are very rapid. So how many and how many generations have we gone at this point? Estimation, if you estimate the biblical uh, beginnings of man. Or creationism. I, I don't know the answer to that. I, I, I find it fascinating. Um, theoretically, if you can have over fifty percent of a given species able to pass on normal genes, then you can hang on to the original genome. 
you know, if it's uh, bacteria that 58% manage to keep the genes, let's say, then the, then the original genome can, can be perpetuated forever. But, you know, if it drops below 50% and a bacterium fissions into two, then at some point you start getting mutations, and once they mutate, they don't go back. That's Mueller's ratchet. Well, then also you have the variable of if the in the human, you know, or you know, if if you're if you're having children in the younger years versus your older years, it, it has to do it's with a great that. Great variation there. But then you see if the children have children in your older years versus you having children in your older years. Um, Yes, you have m more mutations in your older years, but then, th then the the two passages adds up too. So, you can't get rid of that solely by having only young people reproduce. Right. It seems like you could um, figure it out mathematically how many generations that we've gone for ten thousand years. And you said one hundred and one hundred and fifty thousand, or here it's like eighty eighty three four thousand. Well, let's um, let's say that you let's say that you have six thousand years, and let's say that you have twenty years per generation, which is probably conservative. Um, uh, that would be three hundred generations. So we've probably got a little ways to go before it totally collapses, but the important thing of it is that's not something that's going to happen over millions of years. If these numbers are correct, then millions of years is out of the question. Even if you counted every 20 years there was a new generation, say that would be early, you know, I mean, estimated fairly early, r relatively, or 25 or even 30. If you average maybe 30, th every 30 years there's a new generation. They just do it mathematically, you know. So that's it, uh, at least three per hundred years, right? Yeah. Well, th that's one of the things that's interesting. This particular program, you can program as to, you know, how fast you want it to go, how many generations you want, how many, uh, uh, what kinds of mutations you have, what kind of selection you have, what uh, environmental influences you have, and you can put any parameters you want to into there. And if you try to choose realistic ones, it looks like, it looks like things are going downhill and there's not much you can do about it. Yeah, I was thinking that uh, since uh, evolutionists are questioning the calculations, the uh, exactness of these calculations, uh, then uh, since we believe or are more inclined to believe the Bible, that means that these calculations might be uh, rather accurate. If that is the case, that still means that we have a long time to go before we reach 80,000 generations. Because, we do. you know, uh, even if 10,000 years, that's still maybe, what, 500, 550 generations so far, uh, it's going to be a very long time. How, how does that affect the, the second coming? <laughs> I'm not sure that it does directly. I think that humans will still be functional at the time of the second coming. Um, you know, I could be wrong on that, but I, that's, that's what I think. Um, I don't think that this is a doomsday scenario, you know, in 100 years why it's going to be all over. But I think that it is more important to consider what it means for how do you keep organisms alive for millions of years. And I think that that's where John Sanford went and said, you know, you can't without divine sus sustenance, in which case trying to create a naturalistic explanation for what we see just won't wash with long age. And so if you're going to have to give up that combination, why are we doing long age at, you know, at all? Why not just uh, say it hasn't been that long, and that's why we're still here? Um, we had a comment. Um, 
confront here? What, what this shows really is entropy. And things are running down. Uh, but as you said, I think that's a good explanation. This uh, would continue, human life would continue on for a longer time. The greater problem of Earth's humanity is our humanity. And that's what is actually breaking down society, societally wise, uh, much more so than the physical ability of survival. Mm -hmm. Well, I know that uh, there, there was an argument from a design person who said, well, it can't really be, you know, 100,000 or 5,000 years, then and everything should go extinct. Because we have, in, in the fossil record, we have uh, uh, organisms that have lasted for 100 million years. Um, uh, this isn't an evolutionist. This is a long age, a design proponent. Uh, but I, th you know, this is, you know, one of those questions is of which premise is more secure? Is the age premise more secure, in which case these calculations are all a bunch of baloney? Somewhere there's a mistake, we just haven't found it yet. Or are these calculations good, in which case age is a bunch of baloney? And somewhere, the the arguments for long age need to be corrected. Uh, you know, personally, I find the latter to be more attractive. In, instead of uh, just a minute, we have three people: uh, Ariel, and then here, and then back here. Go ahead. This is a general uh, paleontological dictum kind of uh, that a species lasts for a million years. And uh, of course this means that in uh, you know uh, 100 million years you have only 100 successive species. And how are you going to get millions of uh, different uh, species when you have so little time uh, on their on their particular time scale and but it uh, uh, so it, it challenges but they say well maybe we get multiplication early in the game so that we don't have to say that species succeed each other uh, but you look at the fossil record and the, the early multiplication is not there. Well, it's more than that. The hagfish from 500 million years ago, supposedly, sure. look like the hagfish from today. I just read an article last, uh, this week, where they were saying that uh, they're surprised, they're totally surprised. They've got these species in the Carboniferous, these plants in the Carboniferous, uh, Calamites, so on, these classical uh, coal producing plants and they've lasted for 20, 30 million years and they can't understand how could that be? Uh, th this is a, there's a major incongruity here of course between uh, the length of time that you find a species in the fossil record according to their time scale and the variety of species that we have in, in, the, in the animal and plant kingdom. You, just, you can't put it together. They can't succeed each other. So you say, well, maybe they branched off early, and your fossil record does not show that at all. But if they branched off early, then not only ha do they have to last just as long or longer, but they have to last longer with smaller populations which means that the population randomness effect that destroys selection is even stronger. 
I, it doesn't you, solve the problem. No, uh, uh, not at all. Because uh, if your if your average species lasts a million years, you're going to run into this problem. So you branch off a hundred, you know, a whole bunch of them at one point. But then you have to keep these ones alive, while these ones uh, live their lifestyle, die off, and then the next ones have to take over. But now you have to have them live for the whole, you know, if, if this one lasted 10 million years, then this one took over, then this one now has to last its, its own 10 million years plus 10 million to the branch. Yeah, you, so many, now many. you're talking 20 million or 100 million depending on how far down you are. Yeah, you have to talk out of both sides of your mouth at the same time on that one. But, but how do you explain then all these, uh, what we call them, living fossils, uh, which were presumably several hundred million years uh, around? Yeah, the calicanth, the, the ginkgo. Yeah, yeah. and uh, the, the volemi pine and various other things like that. It's, it's, it's incredible. The horseshoe crab. Well, uh, oscillatoria is... Uh, down there two billion years in the fossil record in the Gunflint Church. It looks just like modern oscillatoria. Just like it. Did not change in two billion years. This is a lot of time, you know, it's only three billion years for all of evolution. And presumably oscillatoria would have a short generation time. How many generations would that add up to? Well, actually, oscillatory may not be the hardest problem because oscillatory to... Uh, it's a... It's algae. Uh, algae. So it's a green, a green algae. It grows in ponds, uh, he, especially in Michigan when you were there. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and the thing about oscillatory is that, is that if it multiplies fast enough and has good enough correction, to where there is, on average, less than one mutation period per cell, then you can keep it going. The problem with humans is we know that doesn't work. It probably doesn't work with elephants either. It well, shouldn't work with calicants. But, you know? but if it doesn't work with the virus, how on earth can you expect it to work with single cells? Uh, somebody should do a study on mutation rates in oscillatoria. <laughs> it might be revealing. I mean, it could be that oscillatoria does, in fact, have 50% no mutations whatsoever, in which case it would explain it for as long as you want to. But I don't know that anybody's actually done that in that particular setting. So... Uh, you know, there are all kinds of questions that are interesting to ask and could be asked, but haven't been asked so far. You know, I have a question that fits into this, I think. I'll, I'll ask, um, just last week you had the, um, what you call the central dogma of molecular biology. You put it up on the presentation, yeah. which was DNA makes RNA, makes protein, makes us. Uh, pretty close, uh huh. Yeah, now that us is, that small word is extremely problematic. Uh, another naturalist, Searle, whose book I showed you, says our aim is to assimilate social reality into our basic ontology of physics, chemistry, biology. To do this, we need to show the continuous line that goes from molecules and mountains to screwdrivers, levers, beautiful sunsets, and then to legislatures, money, and nation states. Now here's the question. Uh, assuming that you're an advocate of the evolutionary hypothesis, which you're not, and also a scientist, which you are, so put on your evolutionist okay. cap for a moment. <clears throat> From the point of view of science, if evolution is this sort of continuous line to which Searle re uh, refers, is there any reason to suppose that the, li is it, that the line is of finite length, that it can't be extended forward indefinitely? Do you or your colleagues assume that the line stops with us of this entire evolutionary process now? Well, I think most evolutionists say we don't know. And furthermore, most of them would not acknowledge that makes us is 
really an overstatement given how much we know. For example, uh, DNA makes protein makes us, but what if us decides to uh, add some extra hormones, do a little bodybuilding, then it's entirely possible that we wind up being much uh, more muscular than we would have if uh, we had just left everything alone. And that's part of the you know, heredity environment kind of thing. Um, that yes, it helps to have good heredity, but it makes a whole lot of difference whether you practice or not. You don't believe that, just ask all those Korean mothers who are getting their kids to practice the violin. Yeah. You know, they do better on average. Now, you can argue that, well, the very top uh, maybe doesn't change too much, but on average means a whole lot. Uh, we, uh, there's, there's a lot of potential inside of people that can be unlocked by, by environmental influences, if you like. Some of which have to do with your mother making sure you practice. However, if you take seriously the determinism which tends to be inherent in this model, a hard kind of determinism, because essentially there's no room for free will, then everything you've said should still be part of that process. That yeah, yeah, you could say that. But does it make a difference if a kid decides that, you know, <coughs> I really do want to practice rather than, uh, rather than oh, okay, I'll do this because I have to. The attitude makes a difference. Now, does the attitude come from... See, that's the problem. The fact of the matter is these people are making philosophical assertions mm. that they don't really know. Yeah, precisely. And, and, and making you know, claims that, that just can't be justified by the data, and which raises a question whether the claims are being justified by something other than the data. Which they probably are. Anyway, we had a comment back here, I think. Well, I was just going to point out with Java's now that uh, everything's going Put down. Up where so we can hear you a little better. Uh, I was just going to mention, which we all know, that everything's going down rather than up as far as improvement. But I've got to wondering the other day, and this is probably closer to a joke, um, you know, to say that 90% or 80% of our <coughs> genome's junk or have been saying that, now I know it's uh, coding, uh, non-protein coding. And I was wondering if that uh, is a good reason to be a vegetarian or not. Well, it probably is. Uh, you know, there's no point in damaging the genome more than you have to. And no. for example, nitrites are known to be uh, hard on uh, genomes. Um, so yeah, uh, I think there's a lot of things that factor into that. I think that you know, there's no question, but the lifestyle makes a huge difference in 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 not only how you do, but how your kids and your grandkids and your grand great grandkids and so forth do. Um, and I think it's, you know, if you care about your progeny, there's certain things you ought to be doing and yeah. certain things well, you ought I've, not to be doing. I've almost survived 15 years now uh, multiple myeloma. So, yeah. I'm going to be exceptional. And uh, the thing to keep in mind is that there is not a one to one correspondence between f the genome and the phenome, right. the phenomena, the, the way you look, that we'd like to be able to say it's all in the genes, but we actually know better. Mm. And you can deliberately select part of your environment, and the part that you can select will have an impact on what those genes do. Exactly. Now there's one other thing that I want to point out, and that is that what this is implying is the whole thing is sliding downhill. Now, if that's the trajectory, the question is, how in the world are you going to get natural selection to push upwards to get new information, to get a new species, uh, 
uh, to get a new entire concept, uh, genetically speaking. Uh, th this is this is a huge problem, and I think next week we're going to be talking about what about those beneficial mutations and how selectable are they? And can they counter this landslide that we're going down? And you know, if the answer is yes, well, then maybe evolution has a, has a faint chance. But the point of it is that evolution has to run fast just to stay in place. And right now, it looks like it can't run that fast. Um, it seems to me that there is definitely a urge upon us to try and find research that should be funded and, and carried out. But I'm uh, only aware of one person who's done that kind of research, and that was the late Professor Henning Karstrom, who was the main researcher for the 1947 Nobel Prize won by uh, A.I.V. Virtanen, a Finnish guy. My dad had been, before the war, the lab technician that worked on this. And one of the things that Karstrom came up with, because he was strongly convicted uh, to, to become a Christian, although he had been clearly an atheist before. And so he had one spark that came to his mind when he had been praying about it. And he went into the Valio uh, research laboratories, the biochemical research laboratories in Helsinki. And they had been developing or perfecting the bacteria that produced the Swiss cheese. And Valio cheese won the gold medal even in Switzerland for many decades. But he found the bacteria and he realized, of course, where the bacteria came from. It originates from the manure of the cows. And you can imagine how the original cheese was produced because of contamination in the Swiss Alps. So he took the bacteria that were in the laboratory, and he was able to determine it being there for 25,000 generations. And he went back into the farmyards and collected more bacteria of the same strain, crossed them over, and realized that there'd be no change whatsoever. The bacteria was able to survive in either of the two environments, although the laboratory was, of course, totally different from the continuous freezing and defrosting and summer sunshine that was out in the countryside. But the point that I was thinking about, and the reason why I thought of this is, you have an example of 25,000 generations and no decay. The bacteria were totally uh, capable after 25,000 generations of living in the, in the original or a brand new environment. So that it seems to me that we have to have enough open-mindedness to take up research which we may not prove our point. But we ought to do that and not just, you know, enjoy the theory, because the theory might be very uh, quickly demonstrated not to be correct. But if we had actually more empirical evidence than just the eight, uh, 1918 uh, flu, um, we, we, I think it would give credibility to us, and it would stimulate our thinking. Now, whether we can get funding to do it, that's another thing, but there are many examples of this kind of, even mice have been taken out and been in laboratories probably for 50 or 90 years. So bacteria, of course, is easier because it replicates so very fast. I don't know exactly how you do viruses, but bacteria should be possible. And I think we should challenge our minds to come up with an idea and then see if we can get it funded and someone to do the research. I agree with you. Now, I will tell you something that's kind of unofficial. Uh, I used to do research on Sprague Dolly rats, which, of course, is named after Sprague and Dolly. And... Um, uh, we, we were looking at their teeth. And one of the things we discovered is that over the years, even though we were getting from same animal suppliers and everything, the teeth were gradually getting worse on us. Why, I don't know. Uh, but it does raise the question of whether you, know, whether you can go and say, well, if it works now, it will always work in the future on the same general stock. And all you got to do is keep in, inbreeding them and, and, you know, making sure that they don't get any new genetic material. Apparently, if you do that, you may wind up with degeneration of the old genetic material. Um, and the problem is that it's so easy to assume you know the answers when, in fact, you don't. And that's one of the reasons for doing the experiment. And that's one of the reasons I found 
is stuff on the flu, because I have actually seen the raw data. And it is very striking. The, the, the number of mutations is going up in a straight line. And then there's all of a sudden there's, uh, there's a, a drop down, not all the way down, but a drop down, uh, apparently associated with a refrigerator, uh, refrigerated flu that somehow got loose. And then it started going the same way. Which means that if you're digging around, uh, you know, Fairbanks, Alaska, or, 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 you know, the Yukon or something, and you come across a body, somebody that died in the 1918 flu, give it a wide berth because that virus may still be active. Well, now with the polar caps melting, the, that me? could infuse a bunch of frozen bacteria, bring, it, bring them back to the environment once again. Oh, yeah. Well, what I think would be fascinating to do is to take this, you know, supposedly 250 million year old bacteria that uh, the salt bacteria, sequence it, compare it with modern, and see where you get. My understanding is that it's more similar. It's not identical to modern, so you can't claim modern contamination, but it's much more similar to modern than they expected, which of course raises the question: maybe there hasn't been that much genetic entropy, and maybe there haven't been that many millions of years since the bacterium was put into its little salt crystal uh, uh, prison. The, uh, can you comment on the possibility that uh, radiation from outer space is increasing the mutations? Is, is that something that happens? I oh, yeah. Yeah, it does. Radiation increases. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, it's, it's, it's a known mutagen. And, uh, you know, depending on where you are, in uh, it's it's worse in Denver than it is here. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I was thinking about 3,000 years ago, I think the psalmist said that uh, people lived uh, three score and ten. That's 70 years. Today we have, uh, we have a friend yesterday went to visit a hundred years old. So, uh, is this related to entropy or, or not? Uh, well, actually, that's an interesting question because if you look at if you look at the uh, ages of the people before Moses, it con tends to come down in a nice little curve and then flattens out. Um, of 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 interest also is that if you look at that t text, you will find that David didn't actually write that; that Moses did. Interestingly, Moses lived to, seven, uh, to uh, 120. David lived to 70. Go figure. <laughs> so 120, by the way, is, I think, would be a record, uh, or a near record. I think there's uh, the lady in, in, uh, in France was 126. But Moses' father was supposed to be 137, and his grandfather was supposed to be 137. And Levi, I think, was 140-something. And um, his great, 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 whatever, almost a thousand. That's right. So, so uh, <clears throat> the, the 70 years is not only factoring in how you age, it's also factoring in the fact that life could be brutish, nasty, and short. I, you know, if you fell af afoul of uh, some uh, highway robbers or something. But based on the gestation of the species, 90 to 100 years should be the norm. But I think most humans fall short of that is due to poor diet selection. That is a factor. Well, some of it's poor diet, some of it's war. Yeah, and you know? disease. And some of it's accidents. But the norm, according to the bell curve, based on the gestation factor alone, yeah. humans' lifespan average should be 90 to 100 years old because our gestation is about 10 months, nine, nine months. So the bell curve should fall, should lead to normal life lifespan being 90 to 100 years. Well, it's, it's interesting because um, uh, the, 
uh, Adventist lifespan is starting to approach that. Um, in fact, we have a couple people here who will are starting to approach that a little bit too. <laughs> <laughs> The, the problem is that uh, most people don't bother to look at the figures. If you remove the effect of child infant, uh, mortality, those who die under the age of five, even in countries like Ethiopia, people are living till they're 70 and 90. Yeah. Because infant mortality can be 280 children out of 1,000 die in the first year and 350 before they reach the age of five. So those figures really, most people just haven't looked at them. But it's not all just infant mortality. And the reason I say that is because, e, you know, in America where infant mortality is relatively small. Uh, um, yeah, but the effect of you, 280 you children dying before the age of one and 350 before the age of five on the total population is horrendous. Right. People are living till but they're 80, but yeah. they look like they're dying at the age of 48. Yeah. <laughs> but also, people who are, fi uh, people who are fighting among themselves, uh, you know, the young people are dying at 20 or... 15 or, or uh, 25 or something like that, that also cuts your mortality quite a bit. And the other thing that can cut your mortality is people, you know, smoking, um, drinking heavily. That one, the smoking one is overstated mostly. Only one third of smokers die seriously before their time. Uh, and that is a shocking thing for people to admit because we've been campaigning on it. But that's the raw data. In other oh. words, only one third of smokers die significantly before their expected age. Sure, they live for 17 years suffering from bronchitis and everything else, so it's not to be recommended. But the actual shortening of the age is way overstated by campaigners because we are anti-smokers. Right, N right. We should be anti-smoking, but we're actually against the smokers and we want them to feel guilty all their life. <laughs> right. We should have mercy. Uh, well, uh, there's an argument for that. Uh, but the other thing I will say about smoking is that uh, my, my understanding is that t statistics are about three to five years, depending on whose numbers you're using. Uh, and then, of course, you add other things to it. Pro probably, probably excessive com consumption of uh, saturated fats, meat, uh, probably adds close to that. Uh, one can take the Adventist Health Study and tease apart the various parts of it, uh, and uh, come up with some estimates as to what makes a difference. It's still true that stopping smoking is the single most life-lengthening thing you can do. Uh, but there are a lot of other things that you can do as well. But, but see, the irony comes there. And because I'm overweight, I'm sensitive to this issue. But <laughs> <laughs> the point is this, that of those who smoke, that's their big issue. They're not overweight, or very few of them are. Then out of those of us who don't smoke, many of us are overweight. True. So, you know, you're going to be, the certainty is that you're going to die. <laughs> well, well the, idea, the idea is that if you want to maximize, what you need to do is you need to maximize the entire environment. But part of the point that we're making here is that the environment makes a lot of difference, and that means that genetics, it's very hard to select for. And it's even harder to select for when you realize that the kids have their kids in their 20s, 30s, and 40s when most of our environmental things that are going to have us live to 90 to 100 years aren't there. So that, so that yeah, uh, the population is perhaps losing its you know, top end, but you won't notice it until the top end starts creeping down into the 20s and 30s. But what in intrigues me, going back to the actual original topic we were taking, is that if you take a smoker, a male smoker, because I don't know what the results for women are, and they eat eight to nine portions of fruits and vegetables a day, they do not have a shortening of their life, and their risk for cancer is minimal. So the point that I'm thinking here is, how many other such factors are there if we look at and say, okay, the evolutionist thinks this thing started two billion years ago? What factors were at play first? For instance, were the animals and the crustaceans and whatnot, were they meat eaters or were they plant eaters? If they were plant eaters, based on what we know at the moment, we would expect them to have less uh, negative, you know, TSD or sub-D. So 
I think that's a, an awful lot of research that needs to be done, even if it's only armchair research. Just thinking through the issues and saying, okay, based on what we know, are there factors that could come in here and blow away our desire to demonstrate this plan is only 6,000 years old? Was we need to learn to discipline ourselves and look at the data and see if the other side actually has a case they haven't even thought of themselves, which actually defends their stand. Just a thought. <laughs> I, think that, I think that if one is going to be fair, one has to make the strongest case possible for one's opponent and deal with that. Because I think anything less than that is traditional straw man. Well, come back next week and we'll deal with uh, selecting beneficial mutations.